All right, so next week, this is the midterm paper. Okay, midterm paper. One of one of only three papers you got to do in here. Right? So remember the short, two short papers. You pick two of the three, and then this midterm paper. And then at the end, we'll have the final exam. Okay, so one of only two. This one you got to do, though. So... Um, so it's due next Friday, the 25th by 11.59. I can give you guys that whole weekend to as uh, some leeway, though, if you want. I want to I say the deadline's Friday, but as long as I have it by Monday, I'll be happy. Okay, so I know Sydney said she was going to go on vacation next week. So, yeah, so take your time, polish it up. You know, do do well with it. Don't rush it. Don't procra don't procrastinate though, but don't don't rush it. You know, if you want to send me an early draft or something like that, I'll be more than happy to take a look. Like right now, I have all the time in the world where it's uh, summertime, so I'm not bogged down by fifty other things. So send me a draft if you feel so inclined. So it's going to be a very similar exercise to the short paper, just a little bit longer. I'm going to I'm going to expect a little longer, bit of a longer argument this time, rather than just rather than three or four. Let's say about four to five, something like that. That's kind of what I'm looking for here. Double spaced, one inch margins, Times New Roman twelve, cite by page number where you find a quote. Don't have a separate title page. Put your last name and page number in the top right margins. If you do all that, if you use the template I've given you for all that stuff, you'll you'll get all that stuff right. And so I'm given I've given five questions here. So you only got to pick one of them again. Okay, you only got to pick one of them, whichever one you're most interested in pursuing. I've got a bunch about the American Revolution up here, and then I have one about Emerson and Thoreau that you can do if you particularly enjoy today's discussion. So a lot of this goes on what we talked about last week. Question one, define the agrarian vision of America from letter three of Kreb Kors, letters from an American farmer, along with the essay on manufacturers and Jefferson's notes on the state of Virginia. What vision of America did these two men advocate? Beyond the facts, the most important question here, do you find merit in this vision of America? Is this vision of America possible today following our age of industrialization? Why or why not? You should anchor your points in specific examples from both texts, as well as giving some insights into modern America. All right, so do you, for, to answer this question, do you think that um, you can kind of live a life of, can people live a life of relative freedom, right? Maybe like being a small farmer, right? Can, can you live that life in today's America? Is it, is it, I mean, some people do, obviously, but is it, an, is it an obtainable goal, right? Is this, is this kind of exception? Are those people now exceptions to the rule? I guess that's kind of what I'm asking. So, um, can you live a lot, can you live a life with a, where you make all your own food and don't have to go to the grocery store, right? Things like that. And that's kind of, that's kind of what I'm asking you here. Um, so what American ideas and values are reflected in Ben Franklin's autobiography provide plenty of examples from the text to support your point include a discussion of at least three values so like what values did what are, what are American values that showed up in that text right we talked about a lot of them like um Rags to riches, right? The American dream, um, like sincerity. You know, all those values that he that he had on that page, are they listed them in order? Right? Those are 
those are modesty. Right? Those are values that are part of the American character. Right? We owe more, we owe it to Ben Franklin maybe more than almost anyone else on like defining the American character. Who, what, what makes Americans different. Craft Coors does a little bit of that too, right? He talks about the melting pot. You, you, pro you could probably bring Craft Coors into this too. But what are three values? Like, do you find merit in those values? Like, do those values still hold up today? There's, there's almost a present a present view for all these questions, right? As far as like, do you think these ideas still hold up? Question three, Krev Kora's idea about the great American melting pot is a common motif. My question is forcing immigrants to adapt to American customs, the proper American thing to do, or should there be more emphasis on the immigrants old customs and manners? This is a controversial question in our modern political climate. Use various selections from Krev Kors text to support your point one way or another. So um, you, know, you, you can make the argument for the melting pot or against the melting pot here, right? Do you think that we should celebrate the old customs and manners more than we do? Right. Do all these like small holidays like St. Patrick's Day and all of that? Does is that enough? Right. Should should we value someone for their Irishness or for their Scottishness or whatever? Right. Whatever other one we want to throw in, or should they? Should we just say enough with that? We're Amer they're Americans. You guys all had some pretty strong opinions about that last week, so I, I, I would be interested to read some essays about it. Compare and contrast texts that depict American nature as a garden or as a wilderness. So this is the same, almost the same question from the first short paper, except there's a lot more text you can pick from now. To extend this to our current culture, what texts, this can include films, games, etc. What you think of that depict nature in both ways. So like from the first week, we've since encountered a lot of te different texts. Like we read Jefferson's discussion of the, of the natural bridge. Right? We read that last week. I went to the natural bridge over the weekend, by the way. Yeah, I got, I decided I would take a random road trip Saturday since, since it was fresh on my mind from teaching it. And I went, I went, I, I don't, I actually need to text, get some of these, get some pictures so I can show you guys. I went last week, so that was fun. Where is that? Like, what county? You go, it's right after, so you go on 64 going towards like Lewisburg and stuff. Mm hmm and you go into Virginia just a little way, just past Lexington, and then it's not far from there. It's like 10 miles from Lexington. So like if you were going towards Charlottesville or something like that, that's that's the road that it's on. Okay. Yeah, it, it, take, it took me two hours to get there from Beckley, so. Yeah. yeah. But we have that text, right? We have all these transcendentalist texts today, like Walden, that you could pick from here. Um, with as far as the wilderness idea, you know, you had stuff in the colonial period, Rawlinson and Sanders in the hands of an angry god. We also have some poems here, right? Like for no and Wheatley poems, both play with nature a little bit. Um, and it's also the ones for Friday coming up the, the Prairies by William Colin Bryant that one's an interesting one that you could choose here it's no shortage of stuff to pick from if you want to do this question number five this question asks 
how might one be self-reliant according to Emerson and Thoreau's sense of the concept in the age of the internet, globalization, and private property, mainly owned by the elite? Is it completely possible? Can we arrive at a limited self-reliance? Or is there no hope for it? You should summarize Emerson's idea of self-reliance or Thoreau if you use him as a model before diving into this thought. So the self-reliance, transcendence, transcendentalism, this is going to be what we talk about today. And I will br this discussion will come up, this question will come up today. I'm going to have you guys see what you think about it uh, when we define transcendentalism a little bit more. So um, if you're interested in this one after today's discussion, you can feel free to do this one. Questions, comments, concerns, anything about this that I can address? You have over a week to do it, so almost two weeks. So you, you have plenty of time. Will you upload this video to Blackboard so we can like back play when we're getting ready to sit down and pick our question and listen to what and all you were saying about each one? Of course, of course. Okay. Yeah, I'll I have already uploaded all of our previous classes to there, so you should, okay. yeah, and I, this one will be no exception. I'll upload this one too. Okay, thank you. That's the bit of a loss. That's going to be a thing that's going to hurt when we go back to all in-person classes because it's it's useful having a record of all these zooms and stuff. Yeah. The, current college the administration wants to go from one extreme to another. They want to go to all in person now for some god unknown reason after we've walked after we've been doing this for the last two years. So how about a how about a balance of both? You know? I like the online I like the ASA. This will be your midterm, then we'll have the two more papers and then a final paper, right? So there will be two more papers after this. If you already did the first one, you only got to do one of them. Okay. So you pick two of the three short papers. So, uh, and then the final won't be a paper. It'll be a more of a traditional test, like test thing. Okay. I will, I will, of course, give a very thorough review before, before that test. Yeah, so if you already did the first paper, you only, only got to do one more. So or, you know, if you want to do all three, I'll count the best two. So. I'll wait and see what the grade is on that first one. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. I really enjoyed that paper though. It was a lot of fun, like because I chose um Rollinson, I think, um, where she was kidnapped and, and things. And I I really enjoyed like looking for how she was humanizing. Uh it was just I thought it was a lot of fun to write. Good. Yeah, the she's always a controversial writer in this class people people either love her or hate her that's there's no there's no in between with the roles and, you know, so. well you know i said that you know she kind of she she went out of her way to kind of demonize them i guess is what the word i'm looking for and but when she was talking about especially like where like the day before i think it was the day before but her and, and the dying child, they they flipped over the front of the horse and fell and they made fun of them. And she she talked a lot about um, like just what how barbaric that was that they made fun. And then the next day when they were getting ready to get on the horse, well, they put a guy in front of her to stabilize her. And I just, to me, it was like she was trying to show how inhuman they were, but then she was giving them human qualities too. That's wild, though, when you think about it. You'd think they'd do one or the other, really. Right. 
yeah, I would I would be interested to know, do more research about that one, especially to see like how much Cotton Mather influenced that thing because I think he edited it. So, so like that, um, she wrote it, of course. But I think, but a lot of that kind of stuff might be filtered down from him. So that would be that would actually be an interesting thing to research. I think. Okay, I have another question too. Um, I didn't get your email about the um, like citing your sources and stuff until after. And I meant to email you and ask you, but my Wi-Fi was out. If you wanted me to like fix it and resubmit, because I done it how you posted like the first way. Yeah, that's okay. You don't have to redo it. Um, Are you sure? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I told I told everybody in the class that that was a okay. my bad that was a my bad mistake. So I'm not going to hold you guys accountable for okay, that. Thank you. Okay. But for this midterm one coming up, know that you cite by the page number. Okay. All right. So let's get even if the poems i'm sorry even if the, even if i pick a poem like one of the, yeah one of these poems yeah normally the rules for poetry is quoting by the line number but even if you quote from a poem this still yeah. includes the page numbers fine they're long poems though so yeah yeah, yeah like the, some of the ann bradstreet ones were pretty long especially um, but for no one Wheatley poems, some of them are a little longer. So, yeah, just, just do the page number. Quoting poetry is always a pain in the neck. Like, But remember, too, try to only keep your quotes three lines or less. I don't want to see really long quotes that take up half a page here. That's not good style. Okay. Although I've been guilty of using a few long ones like that in my in my past, so I, I think we all are. So you can use your block quote, but only use one or two if, if necessary. Do general, you even do that in uh, poetry? Like if they're short uh, stanzas, I guess you call them. Is that what you call them? Or uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. If if you quote more than three lines of poetry, you're supposed to block quote it. Okay, but so you can avoid block quoting it, but only quoting like a couple of lines here and there. Right, that way you don't have to reproduce the whole poem in the paper. Yeah, do a little here and there. You don't have to only cite what you need. Like if you quote something and then you don't talk about half the quote, right? That that's a problem. Uh, I'll get a sense as far as like how you guys did with that when I grade your first papers this week. Any other questions before uh, I move on? All right. So there's lots of there's lots of stuff we can talk about today. Um, I'll, I'm going to lecture you guys for just a few minutes before we get into into discussion but then now is the time now is the part of our class where we segue over into the 19th century i mean the 19th century is where most of what is what most of this class is about right we've already i've already explained why there isn't a lot of colonial literature right but there is a lot but it, like we talked about before a lot of it's very untraditional when it comes to like what we think of like what is literature that discussion we had on our first day um, yeah, but um, you know of course the founding of the American Republic was at the end of the seventh it was at the end of the 18th century right so and it's it's most commonly said that American literature really picks up around 1820. Around 1820 is when we really start to see a lot of American literature popping up. Our volume B of our text goes from 1820 on to 1865. 
And as you guys see, the volume B is a lot thicker than volume A. I mean, as, as far as as far as that goes. So um, those 20 years or so after the revolution, there was a lot of literature being written, but none of it, not much of it really had any lasting value. Like a lot of the stuff that was written in those years is very niche, doesn't, didn't really make it to the canon of great literature, right? Of course, we talked about before the canon of great literature is very subjective, but um, like, we, what, what do we throw in there, right? We, we had that discussion on our first day. 1820, like I said, is when it really picks up. So the 19th century, you know, the way that I've organized the rest of the class, I've organized it almost according to genres. So this next couple of weeks, we're going to do mostly nonfiction type of stuff. So we're going to read some this transcendentalism stuff. You're going to get a lot of good poetry over the next couple of weeks, and um, you're also we're also going to read a slave narrative about life being life being in, enslaved by Frederick Douglass. So then the later part of the summer we're going to read early American fiction. So um, Hawthorne and Poe and and those and that, those characters, right? so I'm looking forward to that. Uh -huh. Yeah, only around this time period did we really start to see prose fiction start starting up. The English had a lot of prose fiction in the 1700s. You know, the 1700s was the time period where the novel first emerged as a as a literary form. So there's lots of early examples of, of novels like um, Clarissa was the name of a really famous early novel in England by Samuel Richardson. One of the most boring books you'll ever read in your life. Right? I did not recommend that one. Right? Some, some other English professors might take exception to that, but I think it's a horrible book. Do you have to read it for a class? <laughs> yeah, yeah I, sh I sure did. I swear but, I knew a girl by that name, and she was so boring. Was she? Was she? Yes. Oh, my gosh. As soon as you said that, it made me think of that. <laughs> Maybe it's just the name. It just is, I don't know. You're like, oh. Yeah, it started out as, like, a lot of, like, really early British novels. They were written in, in the form of letters. So like the, uh, this is interesting though, like the author would, like all these different characters would write letters to each other and that's how they would tell the story through the whole thing. So like you didn't really have like a narrator telling you the story or whatever, like all these characters would write letters to each other. Like if you've ever read Drac, somebody, somebody in here said they read Dracula, was it you Lisa? Yeah, it, it's very similar to Dracula. If you've ever read Dracula, that's written in that way. Yeah, you've got to keep on with Dracula or, or you'll get bored pretty easy. It ain't like the movie. <laughs> oh, I, I love the novel, the Dracula novel. But I always did too. Yeah, it's written in that way. So a lot of, there's some other stuff that come out, like Gulliver's Travels was another early, early novel in England. I actually do like Gulliver's Travels a whole lot. I've read that one. Yeah, I like that one a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Tom Jones is another famous early British novel in the 1700s. That's a little wittier than, than Clarissa. Funny thing about Clarissa, the original version was like six or 700 pages, and the author kept adding to it. So by the time it was done, it was like 2,500 pages or something crazy like that. So the day, the day the version you read is the very first one that came out, like only people who enjoy self-torture go through the whole thing. I like uh, Voltaire. That's uh, what's it called? Like can Candide or, or something like that? And, the, yeah, Candide. Uh, yeah, yeah, I really like, I like that one. Yeah, the French, the French also wrote a lot of novels 
in the 18th century too. Their novels are a whole lot more fun than the British. I mean, lots, lots more. The British, the British have always been a stuffy people. Right? They, they've, they've always been stuffy. They're about their manners and customs and all this stuff. Well, the French, the French don't have those pretensions. Right? A lot of those, especially in the 1700s, a lot of those novels written in France were very risque, like lots of sex and violence and stuff like that. Yeah. Right, so how's it what's it, how's it good literature if there's not sex and violence i mean come on right but um so all that was going on in europe you know, so america was slow to adapt so by the uh early 18, 1800s you know we started getting some novelists Americans are the pioneers of short stories. So before before American writers started writing short stories, there wasn't really any short stories in England or France. So we, the world owes us for the short story form, which we will talk more about. But the eight, the eighteenth century or the yeah the eighteen hundreds not the eighteenth century the eighteen hundreds, you know this. Lots of political stuff happening in America in this time period, right? You know, next, in a couple of weeks, I'm going to give you a very detailed account of lecture about slavery in America. You know, but um, of course, we all know that the slavery issue was a hot button issue. I'll, I'll go more into that when we talk about Douglas in a couple of weeks. We've already talked about that some especially how in the colonial period, it was only up until about Jefferson, until people like Jefferson started talking about why do African American, why do Africans make the best slaves? Right? Did it really become racialized? Um, you know, we saw that firsthand last week with stuff like Jefferson. I read that uh, the Fred Lake Douglas, um, yeah, that album gets kind of brutal the way his like his descriptions of, of you know what's going on. That's, yeah, it, it's it might be one of my graphic. Favorite, yeah. That might be, it might be one of my favorite things we read it read in here. It's it's a very it's a very good read. It's very trouble harrowing, I guess. Yeah. Word. Yeah, we're gonna read that here in a couple weeks. But I'll give you more of a lecture on slavery then, especially like all the different laws that was passed and and um, all the tension about it. Well, I'll give you a history lesson uh, when we talk about Douglas on, on slavery. But uh, we've got lots of other stuff going on, right? We had na the Native American removal process you guys all know about stuff like the Trail of Tears, right? The, geno the genocide of the Native Americans that pretty much happened in the early 1800s. Was Jack Andrew Jackson um, famously, well, the Supreme the Supreme Court told Andrew Jackson that he couldn't do this Trail of Tears thing. And he said, "Well, the Supreme Court made their decision. Let them enforce it." Right? So. Uh, Andrew Jackson kind of broke the law even and kind of removing a lot of the natives from their native lands. So, um, yeah, that's a very ugly thing that happened in this, in this time period. Past last week, we don't really get a lot more about Native Americans in here. Um, but this was all going down at this time period for sure. This this time period as well it is oftentimes called the Jacksonian era of, Amer of American politics. The Jacksonian era. You know, Andrew Jackson, whether you like him or hate him, was one of the most important presidents we've ever had, as far as defining the idea of the presidency. You know, he did a lot of he expanded a lot of federal power. You know, but he had this idea of Jacksonian democracy. That's what it's called, it's Jacksonian democracy. And it's this idea that it's very similar to Jefferson's 
agrarian America. I mean, it's this idea that the common people, like the common American people, you know, they're the they're the type. And by a common person, we mean the common white white guy, right? You know, that's the that's what Jacksonian democracy centered around. So Jackson was very distrustful of the rich. He did not like the rich. He did not like the elites. He wanted to give power to the common people as much as he possibly could. So um, Jackson founded what's pretty much now known as the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party was founded by Andrew Jackson in the 1830s. A lot of, I mean, a lot of his ideas are still hold up today in the Democratic Party as far as like what the Democratic Party's values are. Um, but lots of, lots of stuff happening during the Jackson years. All the, if you guys ever noticed in history class after Jackson up to Lincoln, oftentimes you don't remember a lot of those presidents because a lot of them were almost very inconsequential after him so from 7 to 16 a lot of these presidents aren't very memorable i mean you know often most of them followed in jackson's footsteps right they, he was the kind of person they modeled themselves off of so uh, he did a lot of horrible things but he also did a lot of of good as far as like for the comp especially for the common like white farmer or something like that. Jackson was good to those types of those types of people. Um, if you're a Native American, not not much, not very much so. Right. The Civil War almost happened during Jackson's administration. You know, the, the South Carolina threatened to secede in the 1830s, but Jackson kind of put a stop to it like really quick. Like, yeah, that was that was called the nullification crisis. But um, yeah, this the age of Jack. This is oftentimes called the age of Jackson. The, and, you know, it's oftentimes called too. This time period is oftentimes called too the American Renaissance. Right? This is when the American like, a lot of American thinking and philosophy and literature started taking off. And there's lots of other like social reform movements that started in this time period. The women's rights movement started kicking up during this time period. So you have, I didn't assign her in this, in this class, but Margaret Fuller is one of the early examples of like women's suffrage, the women's suffrage movement. Um, there was other movements too. There was a temperance movement. Like a lot of people thought alcohol was the root of all evil. So there was this movement to ban alcohol. And of course that later led to prohibition. Those types of people did. As you guys know, prohibition didn't really work. But um, death penalty, there was a whole movement at this time period that was to abolish the death penalty. This is, this is called the age of reforms, too. So many of these types of reforms, people started debating them. But, so moving more into what we read for today now, you know, this idea called transcendentalism really started to pick up. We read Emerson and Thoreau for today. So I'm going to get, I already have a, uh, I have a, I'll type some notes out on, on this. I'll share this with you. So make sense of some of the stuff that we read for today. Let's define, let's sort of define transcendentalism, talk about its main ideas, and then we can kind of discuss them and see what you guys think of these of these two writers. So transcendentalism is a key literary movement that rejects the enlightenment idea that our minds are passive receptors of sense impressions. This movement sprang up as a result of many factors and has some central tenets. So um, 
I have some let bullet points here. But uh, nonconformity, of course, is one of these tenets. Nonconformity. That um, that involve nonconformity involves a lot of things, but especially religion and our relationships with God. Right? Emer Emerson believed when he called that essay self reliance. He he meant right. You know, he believed he believed in this idea that we shouldn't follow what other people tell us. You know, we should make our own minds up about everything. Like we should all even like have our. You know, he has a he has this idea of God in in the essay Nature. Right, but he you know he believes like even in your relationship with what you call God, right? Mm -hmm. Whether it's the Christian God or whether it's whether you're a deist. And believe in God, but maybe not the religion. You should be able to make your own mind up about these types of things. So nonconformity in everything, but especially religion, was um, a key tenet of the transcendentalist movement. I should make mention that Emerson was a uh, he was a minister. You know he. These are, seem, might seem like radical ideas for the time, but he was a minister. He was a U Unitarian minister. Unitarians still exist today. There's actually a Unitarian church in Beckley. Um, the Unitarians were a branch of Christianity that mostly started in the Northeast, in, Mass in like the Massachusetts area. It's a, it's a much more liberal brand of Christianity. Like they're not as much fire and brimstone as as a lot of other branches are, like like Baptists, for instance. Unit, Unitarians are much more, even today. Unitarians are much more liberal and loose about stuff. Um, still believing in Christianity, but not as much. Yeah, you know, not as much um, hardcore about it. I guess that's the best way to you know, to um, define it. So, um, yeah, we'll, we'll, we're going to look at a key passage from, from nature here in a second to elaborate on this, on this idea, especially of like, what is, what is God in this transcendentalist sense? Nate, the essay nature gives us the best answer to that. This was a time period where East Asian religion, religions started being read a lot. So before this, there wasn't a lot of access to stuff like Hindu, Hindu scriptures, Buddhism, even things like Taoism, Confucianism. Right? A lot of these, a lot of these Eastern religion, Eastern religions, you know, they were starting to be they were being translated into English in this time period. We mostly owe that to people like the British for colonizing a lot of those lands. That's why those things finally were translated over into English. You know, good, good job colonizing them, England. Right? I say sarcastically. Right? But um, all these texts were being translated into English. If you, I don't know if, how, if you guys have had any experience reading Eastern, Eastern religion, religious stuff. I don't. I know Southern offers a religion class. I don't know how extensive it is, but um, if you ever read something like the Bhagavad Gita or Confucius's Analects or something like that, those Eastern religions are much. They're very. They're. I love reading them. But a lot of them are very ethics based, especially Confucius. They're very ethics based. They're about how do you live a good life, right? More so than even spiritual. I said, uh, Confucian, the Confucians, I would make that claim about. They're very ethic, ethics centered. But um, it's very different than reading something like the Bible or the Torah, or the Quran, right? Those are Western religions. You know, Eastern religions are way different. 
So especially when it comes to stuff like how do humans interact with nature, Eastern religions tend to have, people tend to have more of a spiritual connection with nature in those religions. Compare that with Christianity. Right? Christianity in Genesis, God tells Adam and Eve, right, you're going to be the stewards of the earth. Right? Well, the steward, being a steward of the earth is, is a little bit different than being part of the earth. Right? That kind of insinuates that we're supposed to rule over nature. Right? We're, nature is our dominion. Right? Eastern religions don't really think that way. Right? They think we're all part of nature and we should respect it more. Right? God, is, God is within nature. Right? If there's any place that you can see God, right? it's in nature. Of course, of course, they all have Eastern religions all have different ideas about God. Um, just a quick, just a quick mention, just to give you an example here. The Hindus in India, you know, the Hindus are a polytheistic religion. You know, there's there's tons of different gods in the Hindu in the Hindu texts, but it's a little complicated because they think all those different gods are manifestations of a bigger god, right? Called the called the Brahman. Right? And all these other sub gods, right? They're just little pieces of the big god. And they believe a lot of them believe like everything in nature, including humans and souls and all that, we're all part of this big god, this big force, the Brahman. So we if you read it, nature for today, that's that's definitely there, right? We're all part of this larger, we're all part of the larger God, the larger cosmos. If you try to, the Hindus argue that different throughout history, different manifestations of the, of the Brahman have come to earth. So that the Hindus like to claim all religions as being part of their umbrella. So the Buddha was a manifestation of God on earth. Christ, they argue, was a manifestation of God on earth. Right? So if you're, a Hindu, if you're a Christian minister or missionary and you try to go to India and convert a bunch of Hindus, they're going to be like, yeah, yeah, we believe in Jesus. Right? He's, he's a manifestation of the Brahman on earth. Right? I mean, the Christian missionary is like, huh? All right, so that's an example of East, Eastern religion, right? The influence on the, on the uh, transcendentalists is very, very key here. You know, they believe in the importance of individuality in an age of conformity, all right? This includes things like buying houses, right? owning property, Thoreau, Thoreau goes a lot into that in, in chapter one of Walden. Even the clothes you own, right? Like the fat following fashion, all these different types of things. Thoreau, Thoreau argued that we should all be ourselves you know, in an age of conformity. This is something we can talk about a lot today, but if nothing else i think things have gotten worse since then right this this is an age of conformity that we're in today like you know just think about the prevalence of advertising right you know conform or <laughs> conform or be lost right that's almost the america today nature of course is an idea that allows us to find our own individuality so um, going into nature helps us find ourselves. Right? This, is, this is a big idea within the transcendentalists. So let's go to, um, let's take a look at Emerson's essay in nature. Um, I'll give you guys the key, the key passage here that kind of illustrates this idea 
nature is on. I I, I, just, I pretty much just reskinned the nature for today. I reread all self reliance and Walden. I, I skimmed nature for today because there's one key passage in nature that's that's very uh, prominent to defining the transcendentalists. That's on page 183 of of uh, volume B, 183. I'm going to start, I'll start with the paragraph that says, to speak truly. If you're using an online version, it's like the third paragraph into the, into the essay, nature. To speak truly. Few adult persons can see nature. Many, most persons do not see the sun. At least they have a very superficial seeing. The sun illuminates only the eye of the man, but shines into the eye and the heart of the child. The lover of nature is he whose inward and outward senses are still truly adjusted to each other, who has retained the spirit of infancy even into the era of manhood. The intercourse with heaven and earth becomes part of his daily food. In the presence of nature, a wild delight runs through the man in spite of real sorrows. Nature says, he is my creature. Mogger all his impertinent griefs, he shall be glad with me. Not the sun or the summer alone, but every hour and season yields its tribute of delight. For every hour and change corresponds to and authorizes a different state of the mind. From breathless noon to grimmest midnight. Nature is a setting that fits equally well with a comic or a morning piece. In good health, the air is a cordial with incredible virtue. Crossing a bare common of snow puddles at twilight under a clouded sky without having in my faults any occurrence of special good fortune, I have enjoyed a perfect exhilaration. Almost I fear to think how glad I am. In the woods, too, a man casts off his years as the snake his slough, and at what period soever of life is always a child. In the woods is perpetual youth. Within these plantations of God, a decorum and sanctity reign, a perennial festival is dressed, and the guest sees not how he should tire of them in a thousand years. In the woods, we return to reason and faith. Um, there I feel that nothing can befall me in life, no disgrace, no calamity, leaving me my eyes, which nature cannot repair. Standing on the bare ground, my head bathed by the blind air and uplifted into an infinite space, all mean egotism vanishes. I become a transparent eyeball. I am nothing. I see all. The currents of the universal being circulate through me. I am part or particle of God. And I'll end it, end it there. But that's... This is a really key passage, you know, this idea of the transparent eyeball, like this image of the transparent eyeball. Being in nature, it gives up all of his personal, he gives up all of his egotism, right? He becomes one with nature being, by being within it. He gives up his individuality, becomes part of the larger, larger whole, right? I just, I just talked about this idea of Eastern religions Right, being there being one God and everything being a manifestation of it on earth, right? Being in nature, Emerson can kind of give up his pretensions, he's no longer Emerson, right? He's part of something bigger. So, this, this is the idea of nature, right? Being becoming one with it. So, I'll stop for now and ask you guys, ask you guys, what do you think of this? What do you think of this idea, right? especially like your relationship with nature? Like you can talk about, you can talk about what you think of this idea, or you can talk about your own relationship with nature, right? Do you give up yourself when you go out into nature? Kind of like what he's talking about here. Um, what do you, what do you guys think of this, of this stuff? I mean, yeah, it's um, you definitely feel something. I think. I mean, I fish by myself all the time, and 
There is some about it. I mean, I can't really put my finger on it, but it is something therapeutic, and and you just you, it makes you feel better. It's, there is something special. There is something special about being out in nature. That's that's for sure. Been away from everything, you know, putting the phone down for a minute and. It's almost like you're in a vulnerable atmosphere mm. to where, you know, it just clears your mind. It just like, it, it feels like it renews your body. You know, it's just like there's nothing around you to really uh, distract you. And it just, I don't know. It's just a calming effect. Yeah, there is something, I'm like Danny, there is something about it. It's just a place where you can get away and just think and, and you know, just go over your issues and the problems and, and talk to the God that, you know, you serve and stuff. There is something about it. Oh, I, I agree with Tasha completely. Uh, I While she was talking, I got to thinking about like when we go to the beach and you know, you're know you sitting on this crowded beach, but you're sitting there listening to those waves. And there's just, it's like you forget that there's these thousands of people sitting around you and making all this noise because you're just listening to that water. And for me as a Christian, other people may see it other ways, but like, it's almost like you can hear God speaking to you in the way them waves crash on the shore and stuff that and my husband he's an avid hunter and he said that his favorite thing in the world is sitting in the mountain just before daylight and he said you can hear the birds waking up and you can hear squirrels running around and stuff and he said you never feel closer to the lord than when you're sitting there in that against that tree waiting on daylight there's something about a new day dawning. There really is. It's, yeah. Right. Like you can breathe. Yeah. And it makes you feel better. I mean, afterwards, when you're done, I mean, it's just, you know, for the rest of the day, I mean, you, you it, it stays with you, whatever, <laughs> whatever that is, you know. Yeah. Uh, I used to be one of those people, like my sister, if I got stressed out, she would go for a run. And I'd be like, I'm fat. I'm not going for no run. But I, I do like, when I get stressed out now, I walk up the road behind my house. And it's like, it does, I feel like it helps. Yeah. I mean, there's even there's even scientific, you know, evidence on, on sunlight and, and, and things like that. Sunlight, you know, making you... Yeah, happier I guess I don't know, <laughs> I don't know. Right, so there's, there's both a scientific root and maybe a spiritual root here right yeah so, for sure yeah yeah he another good passage that defines this idea is actually in self-reliance look at page 246 self-reliance this I'm bringing up this passage because it reminds me of what Lisa just said about being at the beach. He says, it's pretty close to the bottom of 246. He says, but now we are a mob. Man does not stand in awe of man, nor is the soul admonished to stay at home to put itself in communication with the internal ocean that goes abroad to beg a cup of water of the urns of men. We must go alone. Isolation must precede true society. I like the silent church before the service begins, better than any preaching. How far off, how cool, how chaste the persons look, begird each one with a precinct or sanctuary. So let us always sit. Why should we assume the faults of our friend or wife or father or child? Because they sit around our hearth or are said to have the same blood. All men have my blood and I have all men's. Not for that will I adopt their petulance or folly, even to the extent of being ashamed of it. But your isolation must not be mechanical, but spiritual, that is. It must be elevation. So he goes, he goes into like even like how you have to be comfortable in your own skin, right? Even to enjoy nature, right? You have to 
you have to be comfortable with yourself too. So indiv your, in your individuality is a key tenet here of transcendentalism. I think there's a wisdom in that, right? What's better than a church, right? Right before the preaching starts, right? Everybody's just quiet. Right? You can reflect, right? That 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 passage just reminded me of what you just said about being on the beach, Elisa. It's it's very uh, it's a very uh, similar similar thought here. I had never really paid attention to it. My husband was kind of. I kind of fought for several years about going down there because he's not a water person. And me, I feel like, I don't know, when I'm in the water, I just, I wish I could grow gills so I'd never have to get out of it because I just, I don't know, it's just like water is home to me. And, uh, but when we finally, well, I finally decided we were going to go and I told him to pack a bag. Um, when we were sitting there on the beach, he told me, he said, I've never felt at peace like I have since we've been here. He said, I could sit here for the rest of my life and listen to this water. And that's, that's what I've been trying to get you to understand. There's just something to, to me about water. And uh, I always tell my daughter, because she used to be a water drinker, and she's kind of went away from that a little bit, and she's more into pop and stuff like that. And I'm like, but water is life. If you don't have water, you don't have life. And it's just, I don't know, water, water is just, I was a water baby. I'm a cancer, so. Even a shower, it's like, you know, I, I think of, you know, uh, whenever I'm taking a shower, I probably wrote half my paper uh, in the shower <laughs> in my head, you know. <laughs> I feel like there's something about water that makes you feel renewed. And yeah, I'm like yeah. Danny too, you know, and <laughs> I I do my best thinking when I am doing a mad clean or I'm in the shower. Like that's, you know, the best singing you can do, the best thinking you can do, everything. It's just something, it's a, it's a renewed strength, like just to wash the day away and start anew. I guess it kind of goes back to like a baptism or thing you know yeah yeah every every religion has its own relationship with water right you know, so of course with christians right the baptism like washing away your old sins and becoming something new yeah you guys all seem to this is this is an idea that isn't hard for us to grasp, especially us who live here in like southern West Virginia, where we're all there's lots of nature all around us. It's a little harder for people who grow up in like a more of an urban area, right, where they don't see too much nature, right, to really understand like the therapeutic qualities of it. Today, today, a big controversy is over like. When we think about nature, a lot of it is preserved in things like national parks. Like you can go to like Yosemite, right, or Grand Canyon, or uh, Yellowstone, or wherever. Right? A lot. So there's a real there is a really interesting book by a writer named Edward Abbey. It came out in the 1970s called Desert Solid Hair. But um, Abby was a park ranger, I think, in, in um, I think it was Yellowstone. But he actually has a problem with like how we've even commercialized nature. Like, whenever you think about like, are you really preserving nature by building like roads into national parks and like having all these cars go through the national park, all this stuff? Right? Are you really preserving it? In that or are you are you making it a commercial thing right that that's an interesting question about nature right even in trying to save it are we are we hurting it more yes you guys if you go to a national park like Yosemite or something right do you guys think that we should just park our cars at the exit 
at the opening of the park and then just experience it from there or is there a certain amount of that we have to do what do you guys think of that good i, I, think I guess i've never really worried about it yeah uh, i feel like uh, i've seen too many scary movies <laughs> <laughs> wrong turn If they didn't, there'll be a lot of things that are left unseen because not everybody's able to make the height, the depth or the height to see such magnificent waterfalls if there's not a way that's being cut through it somewhere around it to make it easier to be accessible to actually see it or else all of that would yeah. go probably unseen. You know yeah, what I mean? That's true. Yeah, and it couldn't really be commercial. I mean, tourism and stuff, they couldn't really make money off of. And you're right, less people would say it. And... Right, because I know if these people didn't make those roads, it wouldn't be available for me to be able to go and see, you know? And, and, and I love to do that. That's actually what I spend my free time doing. And um, so I'm thankful that they <laughs> commercialized it so I can see it. Um, I, I, I'm along this. Go ahead. I'm no. along. The, I'm along the same lines. Is uh, I uh, I have a like a waterfall obsession, because again, the water. But I just for something there's something about a waterfall that like I guess it's just that waterfall. I just want to stand under it, and I know that like Niagara Falls, I would die. I know that it would crush me. I just want to stand under a waterfall. <laughs> But it's just, I don't know, it's, there's, again, that renewing feeling that you get when you're in water. It's like all the bad is washing off. Get one of those fancy shower heads and you get a pretty close experience. <laughs> Listen, I tried to find one when we bought this house and I can't find a shower head that, I don't know, I just, I guess I just want to be good with this water. <laughs> you can do that at Twin Falls. Yeah. Yeah, well, we made a hike to Twin Falls there once last year, and I thought I would die, but we didn't get to go all the way because I had a class that evening. And uh, but um, it was, I don't know. I just I love to look at them. My goal in life is to look at Niagara Falls. And to I guess to me it was like you were talking earlier about you know like I don't know what it is about showering and falling asleep, but like you can solve the world's problems in that shower in, or in that like few minutes before you fall asleep and then you wake up and you're like, no, what was that? I had it figured out. And I, but like, even when you're sick and you take that first shower after you've had the flu or something like that, it's just, it's like it washes all the bad off and you get. It your changes remote. your mood too. You can be in a bad mood and be totally upset, hurt, aggravated. But you go in there and you just find out that it really just wasn't nothing after all. Once you get out of that shower, it just changes your mood. Yeah, it makes you wonder how the stinky people do it. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Hateful, stinky people. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's why they're so cantankerous. They're just yucky. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they feel yucky, so they act yucky, don't they? Water will help that. I tell, I know, I say it all the time. Just go and take a shower. You'll feel so much better. That's, it was really interesting when I taught when I was at WVU because there was a lot of um, students from abroad over there. So a lot of them came from like Saudi Arabia and stuff. Over there, they don't have a lot of water to take showers. So like they do, a lot of them just like scrub <laughs> off and then they will use like a lot of like colognes and things like that. So like, like uh, sometimes if you went around some of them, like you would like, they would almost like knock you down with the cologne smell. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just thinking, we got water over here, guys. Come on, come on. <laughs> I know sometimes people don't realize. I mean, that makes it worse. Like, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, because like a fruity armpit is still an armpit. 
Yeah. I, I like what this guy said about um, Emerson. He was talking about the son. Um, you quoted it, but talking about the, the child or, or looking at the son through the eyes of a child or whatever, you know how you get – you know, you, you just kind of get used to used to things like that, like like the sun and the stars, and like looking through it in the eyes of a child. Just how crazy it is. I mean, just the sun. You know, I mean, without it, we wouldn't wouldn't live. <laughs> it's pretty crazy. Things uh, wouldn't grow. No. Yeah, the ocean. I mean, appreciating that. That's that's crazy. You know, a lot of things, I was thinking about this, I was thinking about my kids, like when they were little um, and stuff, the things that they bring you and the things that we get to make people happy, like flowers, it's a lot of stuff from nature. It's just, there's something about like, it's just something simple, you know, your kids bringing you a flower that would put a big smile on your face, but, you know. Oh yeah, for, when it's for your kid, there's nothing more beautiful than a little dandelion and it's just that little dandelion bloom because they don't pick the stem. But that's the most beautiful thing in the world when your little two-year-old comes up to you and mommy, I picked this. When you think back on your childhood and I know me and Lisa's had to do this a lot like in training, so if I, you know, think back to your childhood and everything. The, the best things of childhood is outside. Like, I got so excited because I was, <laughs> I was on a little portion and I was like, oh my God, there's the first lightning bug of the year. <laughs> you know, like I said, you catch the lightning bugs and you stay out till after dark and, you know, you get those flowers and blow the little things off of those dandelions. And it's just, that's, that's the things that you remember the most about your childhood is things that happen outside in nature. We, we came from a time that we could climb hills and our parents didn't really worry you know like we'd go home and my mom would make us a lunch and we thought we were going to california you know we'd be in there forever as long as we came and checked in you know it's kind of sad that kids can't do that now it is well there's definitely a disconnect with nature nowadays too i mean a lot of kids would just rather be on their phones or you know ipads or something than, than be out in nature it's i think it's kind of a problem Oh, it, it definitely is the video games and everything the kids like it's almost like when you we take them out like during after school and everything it's like you let them out the door and it's like oh god the sun's burning you know yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we need water they haven't been out there five minutes i thought but, about i thought about this when i was at the natural bridge last week but like like, is there something, is there a disconnect, even like when you break your phone out to take a picture of the bri of the natural bridge, right, when there's thousands of pictures yeah. of, of the natural bridge? Yeah. You have the most beautiful, like, scenery available, and yeah, you can look through it at a phone at any time you want to, and yeah. it's, yeah. But there's all, there's hundreds of people that are snapping photos. Yeah. With their phones. Even when I go to concerts, it's like people's watching the concert through their phone. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's uh, one of one of the things that me and Johnny talk about. Sometimes we think one of the worst things that we ever got, Rachel, was when we bought her phone, because that's when she stopped wanting to go outside and ride her bike or just walk around looking because she's still obsessed with it. But like she collects rocks, and but she stopped obsessively walking around outside looking for the perfect rock or piece of quartz or whatever and if I could go back in time I wouldn't have bought her her phone until now that way she would have more time my parents did that I was 14 years old when they bought me my phone <laughs> Rachel was about 14 going on 15 because she had been up to Glenville State. She was a Hidden Promise Scholar. They didn't let me talk to her. Tasha remembers this well because I had a mental breakdown that <laughs> week. It was the first time she's ever away from me. And, <laughs> uh, but they didn't let us, we, I didn't, she left at 2 p.m. that day and she didn't go to hold of me until almost five o'clock the next morning. 
and I was a little bit wild and I looked at my husband I was like she's gonna have a phone when she comes home you might as well just get ready ready for it and I wish I had held off like he wanted me to yeah my mom taught me all through elementary school and middle school and so everywhere she went I was always there too so until I went to high school I never got one (laughs) Yeah. Today, today you see like fourth and readers carrying them. The yeah. Like, yep. okay. They had nicer <laughs> ones than I did. My kids had nicer ones because <laughs> my dad supplied them a phone um, <laughs> when we divorced so he'd have a way to talk to the kids and that was his reasoning because we agreed not to let Aubrey have one until she was much older. But then with Jake, he gave him one like in the fourth grade. And his phone was way nicer than mine. I had like a iPhone three or something for years, and here Jake is walking around with a new phone. <laughs> oh my gosh, this is crazy! Yeah, that's about all this nature stuff. If you guys, this also this movement wasn't just literary; it also inspired a lot of visual arts and stuff too. If you look around the middle of the book, where like all the little pictures are, like the about middle of the book uh, one of the last ones you'll see is this like a one of valley picture from uh, 1855 but a lot of like even like american visual art and stuff is just these landscape pictures right you'll see stuff like a farm um some trees right a lot of so a lot of this transcendentalist stuff also helped shape a lot of this like visual artwork that came up at this time period too. Think about how many pictures you've seen of like a farmhouse or something like that, right? It, that this that kind of thing is still prominent today. Um, it's nothing elaborate. It's not the Mona Lisa, right? It's just a nice little tranquil yeah. picture of, of nature, right? So a lot of even like paintings and stuff came out of all this transcendentalism stuff in America. Yeah, see the picture I'm talking about middle about middle of the book here. We should probably also talk about nonconformity a bit. And then we'll get into Thoreau. But in self-reliance is if you ever read any one Emerson essay, it's self-reliance, right? Because he goes off into a lot of this stuff about individuality and not conforming to what others think. Um, the, the central passage I want to draw your attention to here is on page 241. 241. Emerson is eminently quotable. Like you can, you can pull almost anything he says out of context. And it sounds like a great quote to, to, to put on your Facebook page or right? to, to sound wise, right? That, that's what, that's what Emerson's good for here. He does. He keeps throwing them at you. I mean, constantly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You're like, oh, snap, right? That, that would make a good magnet. Yeah. Put on my yes, a magnet. That's mm-hmm. good. But this, this quote, a foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of little minds adored by little statesmen and philosophers and divines. With consistency, a great soul is simply nothing to do. He may as well concern himself with the shadow on the wall, out upon your guarded lips, sew them up with pack thread, do else. If you would be a man, speak what you think today in words as hard as common balls and tomorrow speak what tomorrow thinks in hard words again that contradict everything you said today i then exclaim the aged ladies you shall be sure to be misunderstood misunderstood it is a right fool's word is it so bad then to be misunderstood pythagoras was misunderstood and socrates and jesus and luther and copernicus Galileo and Newton and every pure and wise spirit that ever took flesh to be great is to be misunderstood all right so there's your magnet quote yeah mm-hmm. to be great is to be misunderstood all right. 
But it is this idea, right? Like we could think about even some stuff like politics with this, right? Like, why not just be your own person, right? Why do you have to be Democrat or why do you have to be a Republican, right? Why do you have to follow the pack? Right? Be be your own person. Have your own ideas. Yeah, and if you know if one doesn't conform with the rest of the party, then they're not you know not accepted. Kind of, it's I think it's. Right. Yeah, they'll they'll oftentimes lose their committees, like the senators and stuff will often lose their committees and all this if they don't conform yeah. to the, to the yeah. status quo. It doesn't matter what side you're on, right? Like right. think about like Republicans like Mitt Romney's in a lot of hot water because he's not conforming to what everybody else yeah. does. Then Joe, our, our own Joe Manchin is facing <laughs> the same thing for uh, the Democrats, not conforming to what all of them want to do. Why should he, Why should they conform, right? You have your own mind. Don't let other people tell you what to think. Exactly. All right. That this is Emerson, Emerson's ideas in a nutshell. Yeah. Right. So I'm going to go on one little soapbox here. Okay, I'm going to go on one little soapbox. But the far right oftentimes likes to tell you that college professors try to make you liberal, right? They try to make you liberal, right? We're so, we're so liberal. We're trying to turn you into... Your grandmother tells me that all the time. She says, like, don't let the professors tell you wrong. <laughs> yeah, we're, I'm try, we're all trying to make you into, into communists, right? right? <laughs> Well, <laughs> I do hear that stuff all the time. Well, all I'm t- all I'm telling you to do is think for yourself, right? This this is Emerson. This is self reliance. This is Emerson. Don't let anybody tell you what to think. All right. So there there you go. That's that's my radicalism, right? Don't don't listen to anybody. Don't even listen to me. Right? If you listen to me, you're in trouble. I don't. I barely know how to work, how to run my own life. So, you know, so. I think that's pretty appropriate for uh, what we're reading. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that that's why I enjoyed this class so much. I mean, Lisa was talking about it, I think, earlier today or yesterday, is we all get to really talk about what we want to, you know? Um, you haven't shoved nothing down our throats. Like, it's, mm-hmm an individuality thing we you know we can I think that sometimes like last week you know might have been a little bit more intense or about you know some things in this week or something but we all even if we disagree we just you know, agree to disagree it's just you know that's how life, that's how life, should, life should be it's right yeah. why acceptance is so important to people but everybody wants to be accepted and you, if you don't watch, you will conform to the ways of others just to be accepted. Yes. And I don't, you know, I want people to want, like me, for me, yeah. you know, you don't really, we don't have to agree, you know, for we, you know, our political ways or religious ways or anything. Um, you know, that's what makes us all unique. And, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, you tell Rachel that the the same Jesus that died on a cross for me died on the cross for everybody, and you know you don't treat somebody bad just because they believe different than you. And I think one of the hardest things that I ever went through personally is not being afraid in front of my parents to be my politics instead of what they told me that I should be. Right. It, it caused a lot of anger and, and, and stuff toward one another there for a long time until it got to the point where I wouldn't even really go down there anymore. And Tasha can tell you too that I, I would tell her, I just, I hate the thought of having to go see him because 
they were going to pick at me constantly and it was just going to be nonstop because I, I, I believe my way and, and they're going to believe their way. And, um, but right after the election and honestly, it didn't go in the way that I wanted it to go, but you know what? I, I've, I've lived my life and I've moved on and I'm a happy person. And, mm-hmm. and, but we were sitting down there at, at my mom and dad's and my daddy was, and my daddy's a very gruff man. And he sat down at the kitchen table and we just got to talking and he said, you know, I've almost decided that the media is what keeps perpetuating this anger toward different political views. And I said, daddy, that's what I've said from the beginning. I said, I'm never going to hate anyone because they're going to vote Democrat or Republican or independent or not vote. And I would expect the same respect in return because I'm, I'm going to see it my way and you're going to see it yours. But at the end of the day, you're my daddy and I'm never going to not love you. And Your really, story. It's a, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, but it really made a difference. Like you can, I can go down there now and I enjoy going down there because we're talking about um, like next, this coming weekend is uh, father's day. And he was excited because my brother goes frog gigging for him every year. Cause he likes frog legs. <laughs> And he was talking about that and we can sit and talk about, you know, he's going to have frog legs next Sunday and I'm not going to be there and I don't have to look at them. And, <laughs> and that's just, to me, that's what's enjoyable. It's people make it too much about the left and the right and they don't worry about what's in the middle. Well, you're exactly right about media, right? It doesn't matter if you watch mm-hmm. see if it watch CNN, it said they say conform, right? Mm-hmm. If you watch Fox, they say conform on our side. Right. All of the media is biased in some respect. Right? It doesn't conform to one side or the other. Right? You don't really see a lot of balance these days. Again, think for yourself. Right? Be, be self-reliant. Right? This, is, this is an idea that this is a key American idea. Be self-reliant. Be your own person. But this idea has kind of died in the past 30, 40 years. Right. right, it's definitely under an undervalued idea. So like what he says when he's, oh, go ahead. Oh, no, you go ahead, Dan. Say, he said, every time I find myself among the majority, I, I pause and reflect. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, be be the emo kid in class. Yeah, that's 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 uh, Emerson's yeah. idea. Emerson. <laughs> the, the thing with Emerson, though, this is this is a good way to segue in the Thoreau. Emerson was a guy who, like, back in the eighteen hundreds, like you didn't have Netflix. Like, what was one thing you did for entertainment? People like Emerson would go around and give lectures all these different towns a lot of people would go out to hear what he had to say right that was so emerson did perpetuated a lot of these ideas by just going around giving the lectures and stuff did he really live his own beliefs well it's it's debatable right he but he was he was more of the ideas man than anything else the row is where you start to see emerson's ideas put into practice Right. Thoreau said, hey, I'm going to practice this self-reliant stuff. You know, I'm going to live it. So he lived, he went to Walden Pond. He lived for a whole year. He didn't conform to anything in society. Right. So he didn't, he talks about in chapter one, how he built his own house. He built his own house for like 200 bucks or so. Right. But which was a fair amount by that those standards of those days but he built a very modest home like he made his own clothes he made his own food right this guy completely lived off the grid for the most part he talks about hey it's possible right you can you can live this way and not be relying on society for anything we can we can debate about whether you can really get away with that now. Right? We, now you have everything following you. Right? The government monitors us. Right? We have credit scores. Right? Can can you really escape 
society these days and live off the grid? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe so. Um, there was a story that came out of in Maine a couple of years ago where these guys were just living in the woods in Maine and just like living off the land. And oftentimes like in Maine, there's a lot, there's rich people that own like summer homes and stuff. Like these people would like go raid those places for food and stuff like that. So like they live completely off the grid. Yeah, Walden is the story about this guy who does live that way. It's now don't let him fool you though. He didn't completely live this way. You know, it, it's 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 famous that uh, Thoreau often went home on the weekends to let his mom do his laundry. Right? Yeah, that's uh, that's I don't, I'm not even joking. He actually did do that. Right? So. He let he, he lets you fool he fools you into thinking that he that he uh, did this completely, but, but no, not not completely. Um, it's like the irony of Ben Franklin's motivation thing, you know. <laughs> this is best, but he ain't doing it. Right. <laughs> he probably the road probably came closer than anybody though to to enacting this. Um, he tried, didn't he? <laughs> he really hmm. did. So if, if you read the whole thing of Walden, the, the book here has the whole thing. So even at, like after the class is done, if you're curious and want to read the whole thing, it's there for you. But he, he talks, he lived there for a year, Walden, pretty much by himself. He goes like into accounts about the seasons, like how did he deal with all the seasons? Like how did he prepare his house for the seasons? And and uh, even like basic questions like how did he get water in the winter when the lake was frozen so frozen solid um, so it's, it's a really interesting book chapter one is where we get a lot of these basic ideas right so he talks about a lot of things here like so i'm sure some of you in here are homeowners right well thoreau says if, if you buy a house and go into a mortgage, you're pretty much a slave, right? You're pretty much a slave to the bank, right? He talks about how these different farmers and stuff around Massachusetts might have owned, might have farmed their land for 30 years, but they still owe a mortgage to the bank, right? Is that really self-reliance? Right? You go and buy a car, Right. They didn't have cars then, but nowadays you go buy a car, right? Are you really self-reliant if you owe the bank big payment for a car every month? Right. So um, what do you guys what do you guys think of this? Like, can we be self-reliant, especially when it comes to stuff like owning a house or things like that? Is he right about owning land and owning houses and being slaves to a bank, right? If you if you go owe a mortgage or something, I mean, like I'll even if you, okay. go ahead. I'm sorry. I was gonna say I love that quote in there. There's so many keen and subtle masters that enslave both north and south. I, I love that one. But uh, but yeah, I guess. Uh, I mean, you're kind of. Yeah, under under the country's you know finger, I guess in some way. If you own a house, own a car, I mean, you don't own it till it's paid for. Right? Yeah, and I mean, even, even if you don't pay the tax, you're serious. still relying on your job for your paycheck. Like, yeah, exactly. And and if you don't taxes. pay your taxes, then they the bank has it, even though you you pay for it. Uh, it's never truly yours if you think about it. Right. No. I mean, as soon as you die, if you don't leave it to somebody, the government's going to take it right back over. I believe that he was true. I mean, I guess, you know, I mean, I feel like that. Uh, throughout the school year, I work two jobs. Um, throughout the summer, I work one. And, I mean, you do. You, I, I'll take my husband for in, instance. He, he was a coal miner for, or since he was 18 years old. And he recently just got laid off. 
for the first time in his life. And he's trying to take a different route and he's wanting to do CDLs and all this and that. And, um, and of course he worries about things. I don't worry about it as much, but I can tell in us like going out and him dealing with people, like I'm used to that. That's yeah. something that I've always done. But he has lived, you know, in the mines for so many years and he comes straight home and he just deals with us really. You know, he doesn't go out to the grocery store. He doesn't. And I can really tell a difference in how short that he gets with people and how much nervous he gets and um, and stuff. And that's being a slave. I mean, you think about it. I mean, we have to to survive. Yeah. We don't have no other option. But I'm not ready for him to go back to that. It's sad. It's sad. It really is. I felt that sometimes Thoreau felt kind of like us. I felt like he kind of went off on a rant. Yeah. Like just got on a roll and just let it all go out. Even if you got land inherited to you, it's still kind of like a burden, you know. Um, I like that. I highlighted that to that quote. Yeah. You said it was a misfortune. Yes, a misfortune. And, you know, we've, we, we, me and my husband talked about that over the years. He's like, you know, people don't know how lucky they are to start out and have land given to them and have a house given to them. And and I think, you know, your background is what makes you stronger. It makes you, uh, you know, um, some people's more fortunate than others. But I don't think you take it as serious as what you did if you worked for it. But no matter how you got it, it's still going to be kind of a burden to you. Yep. But we got to do it to keep living. Yep. Yeah. I mean, even if I wanted to do what uh, what he did, just go out in, in the woods off a grid, like I couldn't even come back to society. I mean, I've got all these credit card payments. I got a car payment. I mean, what the heck? <laughs> can't even say that. You just have to the government, wouldn't you? Yeah. Might as well stay in the woods forever, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> And every one of us is going to school. So, you know, you got that. <laughs> you you yeah. got to go and you want to finish there. You got that kind of debt. And, mm -hmm. you know, so, and if you got children, you're always indebted. You can just guarantee it, I, especially if you have girls, you all. Uh, <laughs> and I've got two. <laughs> I don't know. That boy of mine costs a fortune. <laughs> that whole time. Oh, my gosh. Because there's an age difference between, um, him and ivory and so i feel like i'm like gosh i don't think i ever spent this kind of money on ivory a pair of his shoes was 200 dollars the other day i'm like well you're gonna take your birthday money and buy those yeah I'm like 200 dollars for a pair of tennis shoes that you're gonna take a growth spurt here in this summer and not be able to wear them probably by christmas well now i wouldn't ever want to have to feed a teenage boy oh lord Oh, he eats constantly. Michael says that all the time. He's like, we're constantly having to feed him. We went out to, um, this is all subject, but we went to Burger King and we both got our meal two for $9 and we spent $12 on Jake's food. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, and by the time he got home, he wanted to eat again. Yeah, he was hungry, wanted to stop by Wendy's probably. <laughs> yeah. What goodness. So, they're, they they cost a lot too. <laughs> as much as I love my husband, and we've only got the one. If we had another one, I I'd probably have to work four jobs. But like she can just look at my husband and say, "Daddy, I'd like to have that." And I swear, I think he would crawl through broken glass to get it for her. And I'm like, "You're." She can save up for that. Just make her save up. For, no, she needs to have it. Yeah, this isn't just homeownership. Like he, he mentioned a minute ago, uh, Tasha is rants, right? He, he goes on a rant about almost everything here. The clothes we wear. I mean, he, he talks about how we're slaves to uh, of ideas of fashion. Mm -hmm. right? He says here, what's, what's fashionable one day is just sitting dusty in the rack six months from now. Right? As far as as far as like clothing goes yeah and that's crazy how that rings true is ain't it like you go through these fads like acid wash jeans they were big in the 80s <laughs> and then they were gone for 20 years and if i had just kept my acid wash jeans that i had in 1989 i'd be back in style <laughs> <laughs> 
No, because moms aren't allowed to wear that stuff no. anymore. <laughs> Yeah, shoe, shoes, um, furniture. Right? He talks about furniture here. Um, I like how he's talking about comfortability in general. He was talking about, you know, this, uh, I don't know, these one people were sleeping naked <laughs> in, the, in the cold or whatever, and they, and they were sweating. But uh, basically he was saying men, men aren't supposed to be comfortable all the time, you know, how it, make, it makes – men weak or been comfortable all the time i think i think that's good i think you know a little struggle a little struggle is good for you you know it, you learn a lesson from uh from a little struggle right and there's some truth in that for sure what was that one thing kings and, kings and queens who wear a suit but want though made by some tailor or dressmaker to their majesties cannot know the comfort of wearing a suit that actually fit that fits i like that quote too and it went on and said no it said they are no better than wooden horses to hang and clean clothes on one of my, one of, our garments become more simulated to ourselves receiving to impress the wearer's character so it just to show your character then he talked about the patches, and I thought that was a good part too when he talked about the patches on the knees of their pants. One of my favorite quotes in this is on 989, where he's talking about like furniture and objects that you put in your house. Right before that last paragraph at the bottom of the page. He says, the cart before the horse is neither beautiful nor useful. Before we can adorn our houses with beautiful objects, the walls must be stripped and our lives must be stripped. Beautiful housekeeping, beautiful living be had for a foundation. Now a taste for the beautiful is most cultivated out of doors where there is no house and no housekeeper. Right, so I, I think there's a lot of wisdom in, in that quote. I like that he was talking about the old people too. Like uh, what old people say you cannot do, you try and you find that you can. And that is the truth. Like, you know, sometimes we go and we ask for, um, we want reassurance, but they're always like, oh no, you can't do that. You can't do that. You tell some young person that they're going to die or they're, I mean, they're going to try or die, you know? They're yeah. going to do it. And, but they might not always do it the way they did it, you know, but they do it. Just to prove you wrong, prove a point, they're going to do it. Yeah, he, he, Thoreau pretty much says here, old people are full of shit. Right? So exactly. Why, why would you listen to that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's what he's saying. I'll do it myself. I'll do it the way I want to do it. Your ways are old. I can find out new ways to do it, but I'm going to do it. Yep. But that and that was one of kind of the rants I was thinking about, you know, because I feel like we've all been there and we're just like, we're going to do it. I'm just doing it. All right. Don't don't live in expectation of what others want you to do, including the old the older generations. Right? He pretty much said they failed to live their lives, so why should I listen yeah. to them? The big magnet quote from, from Walden is the mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation. Right. What do you guys think of these ideas? Right? Do you guys think that Danny mentioned it a minute ago, like if he lived in the woods, right, could he really escape? Do you think it's possible for somebody to come close to this at least this idea of self-reliance and not owing debt and living simple lot living a simple life right? i think for that to be possible it's going to have to take more of a country mountain person like my daddy i could take my daddy out in the mountains and i know he's going to be all right me i'd die in a day or two but and it, he's even taught me things because you know he grew up 
poorer than I did and I grew up pretty poor like he he was sick and hurt and mommy was trying to work and welfare punishes you if you work throughout the school year in the school system they take away the food stamps in the summer when you need it the most and you know you're just kind of living hand to mouth but I think for anybody to make it completely off the grid self-reliant out in the mountain it's going to take some uh, a country man it's going to take i like bear grills i could pop you, you could pop him out in the middle of nowhere and you know that man's gonna be fine he's gonna find a grub to eat and a tree to cut down that would be these mountain men around here I would like to live simple. In fact, that's always my motto is keep things simple. Um, but I do realize in a day and time that we're living, we do have to depend on. Like I tell you where I live, um, I live in like 30 seconds. I got a grocery store on either side of me. got the dollar store, like I throw a rock at it. Um, and I do probably take that for granted because I'm there every single day. You know what I'm saying? So I probably, like right now, couldn't, because I probably wouldn't even have enough in my fridge or make a meal. You know what I'm saying? I just have to run to the store and get it. But I do believe that life would be better, simpler. Um, I think we can't make it without technology today. Per se, like, for instance, we couldn't even go to college right now if we didn't have it. Um, <laughs> but... Um, I do think life would be simpler and better, I think. Yeah. You can realize you can live without a lot of wants. You'll oh, find yeah. very few things that you actually need in yeah. life. You can and we worry life. about a dumb stuff now. I mean, if you lived out in seclusion, I mean, those worries would no longer be there, that's for sure. Right. You know, I when I was growing up, my early years is when my daddy was a coal miner and stuff and we didn't want for nothing. And like when and I'm really aging myself here, but when the Atari 2600 came out, we got <laughs> one that year and, and um, like cabbage patch kids and things like that. I had several and, but it was when I was a teenager is when we had the hard times and, but that was the happiest time of my childhood. Like we were so happy as a family. We were so happy. We were up at five, six o'clock in the morning in a garden and we worked in it all day long, but we were so happy because we didn't have the wants like Bridget was talking about. We didn't have them wants getting in the way, but we were meeting our needs. Exactly. And that was just, it was a simple time and it was just such a happy time. You know, even with COVID and all the stress that came along with that, there was a lot of good that came out of that too. Like, um, you know, my husband was off work through that. Of course, everybody was just about off work. And we went and stayed at our campers for gosh, you know, forever, it seemed like. And it was just like, everything was so simple. Like, I, you know, we didn't need a whole lot. And we, we talk about that. Like we had the best time last summer. And uh, this time, I mean, this summer's already feeling hectic to me and everything. And, yeah I'm like you Bridget I I want to live simple I don't I'm not I don't need a whole lot you know um you know I got my family and I got my health and everything and last year I started reading this book it was how to simplify your life Lisa probably remembers because I went to work and I was like girls y'all simplifying your life like I was so energetic I was up at night trying to clean my drawers out and you know, trying to just simplify my life because I just want to come home and have that uh, that simplicity, that just not a lot of overwhelming. And and in reading that, I really didn't realize like just the small things just can overwhelm you. You don't even realize it. You do. <laughs> you can actually smother in your own house. You can. You too much yep. you know what i'm saying it don't matter how big of a house you have right right the bigger it is more you got to clean that's right it's like a purse a lady's purse i'm telling you the truth i get a bigger purse i think it's so heavy it just yes. stuff gets down in there i mean and each one i buy keeps getting bigger 
Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes, the kids get married. That's just like our kids, you know. We have three bedrooms, and of course, both of the girls are gone now. One's still in college, and one's, you know, 26 years old. So she's got her own house and everything. And um, this was actually her bedroom, and we've turned it into our office. And it's just like, Mom, how could you do me like that? I can never come back home. I'm like, No, listen, we're going to blow up mattress. You know, <laughs> like if anything for you. She's like, I just cannot believe it. I'm like, Listen, you've been gone for 10 years. Well, not really 10, you know, maybe about nine, eight or nine. But I'm like, it's time for me to move on. I can't have your bedroom still like a, you know, 17-year-old girl's bedroom. I just can't do it, you know. Um, our life, you know, it changes too. Changes. I told her, you have your house the way you want it. Let me have a bedroom there. That ain't going to happen. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> <laughs> but we can just small things can overwhelm us yes they can that's why i said stepping outside sometimes you just feel like you can breathe yeah sometimes we have to watch how we start our day too if that's we a, yeah both both emerson and Thoreau talk about vacations too like mm -hmm. do you are you really self reliant? Like, if you have to go somewhere else and be on a vacation, like, like Sydney is just talking about, she's going to go to Pocahontas County next week. Right? That's 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 not like going to California or something, right? She's still you know, she, she's going to enjoy vacation at home almost. Right? Mm -hmm. Compare that to going to Europe or something like that, right? Do you ha really have to do that to live a fulfilled life? Right. Um, That's right. When we could just pull up them pictures. <laughs> right. Get on our phone. Right. Pull up all the pictures. <laughs> you know, we were talking about me that all the time because I love to go out and he's like, You see it? He said, You see it on TV or your cell phone? You don't have to go there and see it. He's like, You've already seen it. Yep. Pretty, pretty, like pretty, pretty soon we'll all be wearing VR goggles where it's like we actually will be there. Right. Yeah. They're yeah, actually, but if, well, unless somebody's like standing over in the corner throwing that water on me, I ain't gonna get the same experience. That's what I tell him. I'm like, but daddy, go. Yeah, they're actually talking about doing stuff like that. Like you can VR into like a concert or VR wow. or VR, like when they whenever they do go to Mars, right? You can it'll be like you can wear your glasses and be there. Be there. But that That's would not, take away from that human experience, wouldn't it? Like mm -hmm. that we've been talking about. Like you're not experiencing it. Yeah, you still can't uh, smell and taste. Uh, you know, I yeah. guess. But. Is it Sydney? Yeah. Um, I don't know if you. We were talking about waterfalls and everything earlier, and I know you're going to be up there close to this. Um. I don't know if you if anybody here has ever been to Cranberry Glades, but it is beautiful, and it is almost like you're not in West Virginia. It's like you're in the western part of the United States. But you need to check that out. It's right up from where you are, and okay. there there's a place called if anybody likes waterfalls and likes to walk and likes to feel uh, likes to be sore for a few days. Um, <laughs> it's called Falls at Hills Creek, and it's right up there. Look it up, and it's um, there's three different levels to this waterfall. But if you go down to the very end, I counted the steps. Me and Lisa was talking about. I can't remember exactly, but it's like 380 some steps to get back up to the top. So I couldn't walk for a couple of days. Like it, it was bad. Yeah. But um, I mean, like I told my husband, I'm counting my steps to get out of here. And when I go down, I'm going to scream out a number. Make sure you put it in my obituary. That was the step that took me out. <laughs> because I'm not doing this again. We're going all the way to the bottom. But since you're going to be up there, Cindy, you might want to do that. You sound like an adventurous person. Yeah, that sounds fun. Get up. You can always email me. Okay. <laughs> I should make a quick mention that Walden in the Day is tourist attraction near Boston, right? And actually, um, humans, there's actually been some articles where humans have had a, 
really adverse effect on the lake you know, because so many people who read this book will go there and that's actually hurting the land. So uh, fun little fact for you. Is it still a wilderness or have they commercialized it and modernized it? It's, it's, it's very commercial. Yeah, I've never been. I want to go just because I love Oro. Mm -hmm. But uh, at the same time, I'm like, are you really, are you really doing it a favor by going? You know what I mean? Yeah, he wouldn't want it bad. Yeah, just take a, a trip there in your imagination. Yeah, <laughs> and see it how maybe he might have seen it. You can find lakes just as cool as that around here, right? Wow. Yeah, it looks like well, some, just... some do. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's pretty cool. He's already there. <laughs> Y'all need to go to the insane get your, asylum. Get you a selfie there with that background behind you. And... I did go there last year. <laughs> and waste them? Yeah, I went there last year. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm Carmen. I'm Carmen San Diego over here. I'm somewhere new every week. <laughs> We're laughing because we know who that is. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody else is like, well, else is like <laughs> well, see, I was thinking of Waldo. <laughs> his, name, his name was what? Um, Ralph Waldo. Yeah. Yeah. I was even like, where's Waldo? <laughs> I was thinking about that earlier. You just right, yeah. trench coat. Didn't Carmen San Diego wear a trench coat? And that big yep. hat. <laughs> that rich. She always wore red. Yep. All right, guys. So to prepare you for next time on Friday, we're, you're going to read the poets you're going to read for Friday, the, saying whether they're transcendental or not, it's up for debate. But especially the William Colin Bryant's The Prairies. That'll be an interesting poem for you all to read, especially with um, talking about Native Americans. So you'll get a little bit of Native American stuff for Friday. But next Tuesday or for our next Zoom discussion, we're talking about the two big American poets, Walt Whitman and Emily Dickinson. So Walt Whitman was, both of them you can you, you can classify as transcendentalist in their own ways but Walt, Walt Whitman especially so um, he took this idea so we don't Americans can write their own poetry we don't have to follow the rules of England anymore so you're going to read his poem called Song of Myself for next week it's a good you guys will love Whitman's awesome you guys will love Whitman I think um, yeah, he, he, he was very controversial for his day. So um, he's still controversial in some ways. So I'll be interested to hear what y'all have to say. The Dickinson poems you have to read, I think on the syllabus, I put the numbers because those her poems don't have titles or numbers like poem 247 or something. You said to see the table of contents for yes. the page numbers. Yeah, so look at the table of contents at the beginning and to see which poems I want you to read. Okay. I'm not going to have you read all, read them all, just some of the big ones. Okay. So that's why I said, there's a look at the table of contents because her poems don't have titles per se. And yeah, it'll be, it'll be a good time. So, um, I'll get your questions up. I'll probably get the Friday questions up tomorrow because I need to reread the stuff. So um, I'll try to get those up for you tomorrow. And then, other than that, we'll see you guys next week. Have a good week. Yep. Yeah, good night. Bye. Bye. Bye.